I'm Jonathan O'Connell, the Washington Post. Uh, this last segment is about Washington, D.C., uh, its economic development, urban re revitalization. Uh, I have a wonderful panel here I'm really excited to have here. Uh, first on my left, we have Brian Kenner. Uh, Brian is Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development under Mayor Muriel, Muriel Bowser. Uh, and I have Nicole Mozalek, uh, who is um, General Manager for WeWork in the Mid-Atlantic Territory. We work growing really fast in Washington, very happy to have her. And Sean Seaman. Uh, Sean is Principal and Executive Vice President of P.N. Hoffman. Uh, P.N. Hoffman is the, the main developer behind the wharf, the new uh, waterfront development down in Southwest, just opened, perfect timing, I'm glad, I'm so glad to have Sean here also. Um, I'm gonna start with Brian. Um, you know, well, it's, part of the reason I'm really happy to have this session right now is that in a lot of ways, Washington, D.C. is booming we have a, a growing population, uh, growing tax revenue. Um, what is your focus as deputy mayor during a time when, at least on a lot of the demographic numbers, yeah. Washington, D.C. is really booming? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think the mayor probably says this best. Uh, she says that it's no longer a situation where Washington's trying to attract things. For many years, really over the last 20 years, we were trying to get our first Costco, our first Target, uh, we're trying to get our first sit-down restaurants uh, in, in certain neighborhoods. And instead of that question, I think that the question uh, that we're confronting and a question that many high-cost cities are confronting and the question we're going to be confronting going forward is we want to make sure that we have all of those things in the places where they are not right mm -hmm. now. And so that's why we spend a tremendous amount of time in my office focused around how do we provide economic incentives for things that are going into communities that have been underinvested in the past? How do we continue to incentivize Starbucks and other places to go into uh, communities that they haven't gone into? And then obviously, how do we focus on affordable housing? You know, mm -hmm. we, we in Washington, uh, like many other cities, uh, we are increasingly uh, becoming an expensive place to live. And we want Absolutely. to make sure that we provide places for people to live that have not only been here uh, for five generations, but even if you've been here for five minutes, we want the, the opportunity for you to be able to live in the District of Columbia. Yep. Uh, Nicole, I know you guys are really big investors in the Washington area, yeah. around the country, but Washington, I know, is a main focus for you. Yeah. Uh, you have the We Live in Crystal City. Okay. There's not very many. How many We Lives are there in America? Uh, right now, there's two. So, well, uh, there we go. Yeah. We got, we're one of the two places, you yeah. know, the area is one Pretty of the two awesome. places for live there. We Live. And then how many desks do you have from We Work in the area? Uh, we have over 8,000 desks in the um, right. DC metro. So, it's over 10 buildings and about yeah. 8,000 plus desks. And why is the Washington area such a focus for, for We Work growth? I think it's a natural natural uh, evolution of the WeWork brand, um, when we start thinking about the cities that we want to be in, you think about incubator spaces, you think about places where thought leaders live, and certainly, obviously, DC is at the forefront of that. So it makes absolute sense for us to be in this space and to continue to grow and develop um, right alongside with you know the, the city and, and all of the policymakers that are here. And it's not just about policy for mm. WeWork. It's also about our thought leaders, creative technology folks who are in our space. Space. We have global enterprise in our space, so we have a nice uh, collaboration and a nice community that represents all different business segments. Mm. Um, Sean, I, many people may not have been to the wharf yet. It's only been open for like six weeks, eight weeks now. Yep. Six, so six weeks. do you want to maybe just explain to people what they'll see when they get down to Southwest and what the first phase of the wharf is? Sure. The, the wharf is really the district's newest neighborhood. It's in the southwest quadrant. Uh, many may be familiar with the historic fish market. It's the oldest um, constantly activated fish market in the United States, and it's one of the historical assets that the, the wharf was built off of. Um, it's a 3.3 million square foot mixed-use community, um, and it, it really is a neighborhood first, not a, not a real estate project. It's a, a mix of hotel, retail, uh, residential. There's affordable housing, a huge affordable housing component as part of the, the district's mandate. Um, there's office, um, half a million square feet of office in the first phase. Um, and it's, it, it really, the, the neighborhood focus was important for us. The district is a, is a community built on neighborhoods. Uh, the strength of DC is beyond the, the federal city is really the places where people live in the district. In Southwest, 
uh, has, has been a vibrant community. It was uh, the location of the largest urban renewal project in, in the country's history, and it's been through some ups and downs. And it's, the, the wharf is the revitalization of the core of the, the southwest quadrant of D.C. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I think connects the work that all of you do is, um, particularly since the recession, D.C. has been uh, a big attraction for millennials. And I know there's like sometimes too much attention on the millennials probably, but there, there's a reason for that, which is, all the apartment construction in the city is driven by millennials moving here for jobs. All the new restaurants we have, all those, those demographics are dri have been driven by these millennials moving in. And more recent data shows that millennials are either uh, leaving the city in more frequently than they're coming here, or when they reach a certain age, they're deciding to leave the city. I'm interested in from hearing from each of you how that affects your work. Sean, I don't know what, if you already have information about like who the customers of the wharf are, uh, if you know anything about who the apartment renters are, who's coming to the new restaurants that you have. What, what do you know so far? Well, I can, I can tell you where the target was for us. The, we have two apartment buildings in the first phase. One is a 500-unit building that is, is actually uh, surrounds the Anthem. That's our, our concert hall that we've uh, developed in partnership with IMP, a, a local concert promoter. Uh, the Anthem is the energy in that, in that parcel. The residential wraps it, and there's an acre of sort of communal space on the roof of the Anthem that the apartment users use. That was really targeted at sort of a millennial. Um, urban hipster was the, the name right, that the yeah. marketers came up Absolutely, with. Absolutely, yeah. um, But who doesn't want to live next to a concert hall and live live next, uh, who, who <laughs> below the age of 30 doesn't want to live <laughs> next you. to a concert <laughs> hall <laughs> and, and live across yeah. the street from where you work? Yep, um, absolutely. And you know, I think we, we were trying to come up with sort of a full service environment where there's entertainment, there's restaurants, there's your workplace, and I think I think really what I've noticed is millennials are not really willing to commute, commute long distances. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen the opposite. I think people are trying to get closer to the core, closer to the activity, and trying to provide opportunities as a developer. We're looking for places closer in, not, not further out, at, yeah. at least at PN Hoffman. Nicole, I think I assume, not being an expert on WeWork, that mm -hmm. All the members are between like 22 and 29, and would either be at WeWork if they weren't like on their couch or you know something like that. Is that actually the fa fact, or do you have no, we have a, a wide diversity of members? We have a pretty wide diversity of members. Um, we do have a lot of the millennial generation. I think by just the natural um, migration of people into cities. I mean, you're finding now that more than half of all of humanity lives in cities, and people are moving more and more into a city environment. There, to your point, Sean, you don't want the commute. You're looking for the ease of all the services that are right at your fingertips, and a city has to offer that. In a typical WeWork building, because we have such a vast community, we attract um, a more mature uh, employee uh, mm -hmm. that will come into our space, and they become great members for us. And we also have a millennial generation that's you know fairly active. And what we're looking at is ways that we can bridge in a community environment in a WeWork building. Mm -hmm. How does everybody get together and share ideas and incubate? And that's really been the, the kind of the secret sauce to what WeWork does is we can really bring everyone together and find that common ground regardless of generation. Right. I mean, WeWork tracks very closely with innovation entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. the startup companies, obviously. So do you all track, like, are you tracking the, the number of millennials and young workers moving to Washington? And now that it's kind of tapered off, do you think, oh, maybe we don't want to grow as much in Washington? Is that like a, what factors do you look at? No, I mean, I, I, look at, I look at a whole bunch of things when I look at how we expand. And we have a wonderful real estate team that's uh, based in our New York office. And, and they help us really look at some of the demographics. I would say, you know, Washington, D.C. is still a huge expansion opportunity for us. Um, where you have no intention of slowing down in this market, and uh, I can't really share our future growth plans, but oh. there's, there's some stuff coming down the pike. I do think that there's uh, some data that can be derived from our members, um, and we also have just partnered with the Aspen Institute to actually do some formalized studying with mm. that we can actually provide to cities and mayors around how to plan and what employees are looking for, um, and we can base that off of uh, that partnership with the Aspen Institute and, and surveys of our, our members, because we have over 160,000 members globally. So there's some really rich data um, that'll help people make decisions around how cities and urban planning happen yeah, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I actually think Sean's point about who wouldn't want to live by a concert venue is wonderful because we are in Washington, we have more and more places that are awesome to live if you're 25. Like you can get a great apartment, you can walk to your work, you can walk to a concert, you can walk to like 10 different great restaurants. I think, I'm wondering for you, Brian, you know, part of your job, I, I assume, is 
figuring out how to keep those people as they become 30. They decide they want to have kids in some, some cases. They decide they want a bigger apartment in some cases, even though many of the new apartments in the city are not very large. Mm -hmm. What uh, are the city's efforts to, to um, sort of retain millennial workers as they kind of age out of that concert hall life? Yeah, and uh, I'm glad you called it concert hall life. That's a, good, <laughs> that's, that's great, that's a great term. The you know the the thing um, one of the things that we're seeing in Washington D.C. is exactly what you mentioned. Um, many of the people who move here to start a job, and increasingly, especially over the last six or seven years, that's been a private sector job, not a public sector job, mm -hmm. uh, because public sector job growth has been flat. Private sector job growth has really been climbing in the District of Columbia, so they're coming here for a private job more more likely than not. Um, we are seeing um, increased family formation in the District of Columbia. Uh, DCPS and charter school enrollment is increasing in Washington, D.C. We are seeing those people who came here as a single are forming families and they are sending their kids increasingly to either public school or charter school, but they're staying here in the District of Columbia. What that means is that we need to be focused around how do we get bedroom mixes uh, to mm -hmm. accommodate that? How do we get first move up opportunities for people uh, I know there are a variety of, of real estate developers that are um, working around uh, some interesting concepts for townhouses that will effectively be you move from an apartment into something like this, which is a two mm. to three bedroom uh, place. And that is the kind of housing stack that we're going to need because we are an expensive city, um, because we are continuing that trend of being an expensive area. Uh, but more importantly, people are finding the Washington, D.C. and the Washington region to be a really attractive place to have a family and to have a job. Yeah, and sure. that is something that, you know, I think Tony Williams probably 20 years ago or so sort of said, we need to be getting more people to move into the district. We need people to stay. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. Yeah, it's a, it's a personal issue for me also. I'm a father of young children. Yeah. Every year I would say I have a friend who moves their family to Silver Spring. Mm -hmm. And just, and partly that's because they have an older housing stock of you know, larger homes that are not all that expensive and they're dealing with longer commutes, obviously, if they're coming downtown every day. But it's a decision that I think, I just see people going through all the yeah. time. Um, so th this kind of rolls into the next topic, which, uh, you know, for other big cities in America that have done very well the last <coughs> five or 10 years, the New Yorks, the Bostons, the Seattles, San Francisco's, all of them are dealing with the, the question of uh, inclusivity and diversity and what we are going to do to prevent just becoming a city full of only the wealthy or only the very well off or uh, only the small unit um, household sizes that can fit in small apartments. Brian, what are you doing in terms of um, work on inclusivity as DC continues to grow? Uh, thank you. Uh, a few things. One is that we recently released our economic development strategy, which is really focused on doing two things uh, for Washington, DC for the next five years. One is growing our private sector economy. Uh, which continues this trend of continuing to diversify the economy in Washington, D.C. But the second point is we are focused on increasing economic opportunity in those census tracts that have greater than 10 percent unemployment in the District of Columbia. Hmm. And that is a very specific goal in our economic development strategy, which is we are going to be focused on making sure that we target those areas that are hardest hit in the District of Columbia. And I think that's the first time that our economic development strategy in the city has really been focused on where we want to place economic uh, incentives, where we want to be most impactful uh, to Washington, D.C. The second thing uh, that we're doing is that we know that increasingly technology and innovation jobs are becoming very popular in Washington, D.C. And earlier this year, we opened uh, sort of the first, I think it's the first national uh, inclusive innovation incubator, which is really focused around how do we take advantage of the fact that Washington, D.C. has one of the highest percentages of female entrepreneurs in the entire country. That deserves applause, by the way, if anybody's. <laughs> uh, we are also one of the highest proportion, have the highest proportion of people of color entrepreneurs in technology and innovation as well. And we want you increasingly to think, if you are thinking about starting a company, whether you're located outside of the district or whether you're located in the district, and you are a woman or a person of color, we want you in Washington, D.C. So we made a personal investment along with Howard University uh, to create something that is really 
uh, unique in the country. And I think that that speaks again to where we're putting our resources. Yeah. I think this seems like a growing area of interest for WeWork. Is there something you all are doing in terms of inclusivity that is new? Sure. I mean, I think that we, we look at all of the real estate and, and make good decisions based on where we think we can grow and, and support our neighborhoods that we're in. We're very inclusive. We want to be part of the community. We don't just walk into a space and, and try to insulate ourselves. So I think that it, your, your policy falls naturally into where we want to be. I think the other thing that we do, and, and we're pretty good at it, is um, you know incubating the nonprofits, bringing them into our space, giving them um, the economic uh, advantages of some discounting to allow them to be in the space so that they can start to incubate and affect the community that they're in. A lot of times that they're a, a nonprofit, a startup that's working directly in that particular neighborhood, and so they want to be based in that neighborhood and, and really be the headquarters for what they're trying to do. And most recently, you may have uh, seen and heard, you know, we've just done the Veterans in Residence uh, launch on November 9th, and we're looking at, um, you know, hiring and employing a, uh, a 1,500 veterans, um, and we also are have them in our space through a partnership with Bunker Labs so that they can actually come out of the military, they're veterans who can then start their own businesses and really start to return into this into society and, and provide in the communities that they that they are re-entering. So yeah. it's pretty exciting for I us. Think, and I think it's interesting, about. you know, Brian was talking about trying to get, we have uh, unfortunately a wider disparity in terms of equality in the city, like a lot of big cities. And you'll notice if you look at the demographics that Ward 7 and 8 east of the river are behind in lots of economic categories from the rest of the city. So you hear Brian talking about he's trying to get a Starbucks to go east of the river. He's got a Busboys and Poets that's on the way at on some point, way. hopefully, on right? Way. Yes. It's like, would we work ever open in a neighborhood east of the river? I don't know how well you know DC or not, but like, yeah, I, I don't I know mean, what the metrics are that you, you all look at. I, you know, I look at, um, I think that it's within the realm of possibility. I think it really it oh, becomes a, a, a partnership. <laughs> yeah, I think it becomes it becomes a conversation that we need to we need to have and make sure that you know it works for for everybody. And I think that you know we are have a vested interest in D.C. And if this helps advance D.C., then I think that there's opportunities for us to explore you know further expansion. I mean, we're not walking away from the city of D.C. and, and we're here to support it. So we'll figure out the right uh, appropriate ways to to be beneficial to the community. Yeah. What's it like for you, Sean, trying to be uh, an inclusive part of the Southwest neighborhood? Well, I think, um, well, two, two points to that end. I think the, the, the project itself being part of the deputy mayor's uh, portfolio for economic development projects for the district um, has allowed us to do things um, that are fairly progressive as far as affordable housing and jobs for district residents. And I think that sort of investment in the East of the River communities um, is in, in job creation is, is very important. We've spent $350 million on, on our project alone with district residents, uh, district owned businesses rather. Um, we've put district residents to work um, over 600 during the construction phase of the project. Um, and over 30% uh, of those were east of the river, um, which is you know part of the deputy mayor's mandate. It was part of the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative, which uh, many may remember was created back in the, the early 2000s, late 1990s with the um, earlier administrations. Um, so I, I think that, that was an important part of our project. Uh, the affordable housing goes down to 30% of the area median income. Um, that's $30,000 or thereabouts for um, you know, the 30% tranche and then 60% AMI. We have workforce housing uh, for workforce residents. Um, so there's a broad spectrum of housing at Southwest. Yeah. And as, as far as being inclusive, uh, Southwest is actually in Ward <coughs> 6, not Ward 7 and 8. Um, but the, the, the neighborhood in, in Ward 6, Southeast and Southwest, is probably the strongest that I've, I've worked with in the, in the district. Um, and they feel passionately about all the development that's going on in, in both the, the wharf and the, the southwest quadrant, but also the yards in the, the Capitol Riverfront District. Um, it's seeing an explosion of development projects. It's probably the most active ward construction-wise in the district right now. And they're actively involved in trying to make sure that families can, can stay in their ward, that uh, schools are improved, and that the general quality of life is improved for that entire area of the city. Yeah, one thing I think has been interesting over the recent years is to see some of these really big mega projects open in different parts of the city. And sometimes in parts of the city where, like you all, where a lot of the things you're bringing are much nicer than the things we had there for really nice restaurants, chef-driven concepts. You know, If you go down to the wharf, you'll see these beautiful 
um, attractions along the waterfront. It's really, um, you know, and the, the concert hall. It's really, really nice stuff. Um, and, you know, each of those developments have had to make decisions about what's open to the public, how to keep everybody feeling safe, how to do lighting. And you can see little things differently. If you go to cities that are downtown, they have uh, you know, an open public park and places for people to go and, and whatnot. But then you go to the yards in Southeast, and I remember the, the, they have that water feature in the yards, which was not built for people to go into. It was just built <laughs> for like, people to enjoy. And now you go to Miss Simpson, it's like 100 kids in there all the time, including my kids. It's like <laughs> bathing suits, goggles, like the whole deal. What, uh, what, what kind of decisions have you had to make about you know, how uh, kind of open to the public and how, you know, there's like the spectrum of keeping it open to the public but also keeping it safe. What are the decisions that you've had to make in Southwest in terms of, you know, just opening, being open to the public? Sure. I, well, I think the, the biggest decision we made was turning the fronts of the buildings to face the water, which I think mm -hmm. was one of the mistakes that was made in the 60s and 70s during the, the, the renewal plan for the, the Southwest waterfront. Yeah. Uh, and I think the business has ultimately failed because the real asset um, the real asset for the district is its water. I mean, we have over 20 miles of waterfront in D.C. Most of it's federally controlled, but when you have an opportunity to control a, a mile of it that's district-owned uh, through the efforts of the, the deputy mayor, the mayor's office, and also uh, our, our congresswoman, Norton, trying to get that land back from the federal government so it could be actively used by the district. That, that was probably the biggest decision we made, but then creating spaces for people. I think, um, you know, there's been mention of art and public spaces. I think at the yards, the, the greatest art there is the fountain. And the, I mean, it's basically the swimming pool for, for Southeast. I, you know, families take their kids down there. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I think, you know, likewise, we have, we created four public piers at the wharf. Yeah. Uh, there was never an opportunity to go out on the water and look back at the city. Now we have four different public piers. There's one that's focused on civic activity. There's a recreation pier. It's got a boat launch. It's got a jitney that takes people to East Potomac Park. I mean, previously you couldn't get from one side of the channel to the other, and that's you know that sort of thing is there. We built a fire feature at the end of it, which is you know it was sort of the last thing we designed on the recreation pier, but it's become sort of the you know the central hub of the the waterfront activity for us. Yeah. Um, Just remember to the audience and uh, you all out there following on online, uh, we are using the hashtag uh, Transformers. If you have to, if you want to ask a question, I'm going to start taking questions in a in a minute or so here. Um, but I would be remiss if I not if I did not bring up transportation today. Uh, saving Metro, I don't think that's too strong of a term here, has been a priority for the whole region for a number of years now. Definitely has not been solved. Um, I'm interested from both Sean and Nicole about if you have information or expectations about how many people who come to your properties will be arriving by Metro versus you know, car, bike, uh, et cetera. What, what are your thoughts on that? I don't have any statistics on that, but I will tell you that I think it is a huge draw uh, in terms of proximity of our buildings, ease of transportation. Um, certainly, as you look at urban planning and the way density and, and the shift in the way we live and work, and more and more millennials and or older generation are moving back into cities, they want to become less reliant on cars. Um, and so I think that the, it's a natural expectation that public transportation needs to be ready available and accessible to the masses. So. Yeah, but what about you, Sean? Do you have any idea how many of, like how people are going to get to the wharf? Is it, how much is Metro, how, how much of a part is Metro of that? Well, we have, we have two Metro um, access points at L'Enfant Plaza and Waterfront Station. Um, we're still about a quarter mile walk to, to either of those. Um, so we looked at transportation very carefully when we designed the project. We have uh, 1,300 parking spaces in our first phase, but that's obviously not enough if we have 6,000 people at the concert hall. And we looked at the parking as sort of a shared shared resource. We did a shared parking analysis, and we we really thought a lot of the office users would look for alternate transportation. So we have over, I think it's over 1,200 bicycle parking spaces in our parking garage. We have three of the Capital Bike Share stations. Uh, we created our own shuttle that it has a, a loop through Southwest that uh, stops at L'Enfant Plaza, goes to the mall, and hits the Spy Museum down the L'Enfant Promenade, mm -hmm. the Jitney that I mentioned. And then the water taxi, um, Entertainment Cruise Lines, and the Potomac Riverboat Company joined forces to create a water taxi that's 
I mean, it's, it's, there have been water taxis in the past, but this is really sort of a regional transportation uh, solution. They built two new boats specifically for the Potomac River, and it serves right now Georgetown and Alexandria. Hmm. But I can imagine boat, tr boat travel actually being a, a legitimate way to get around the district. It, it, you know, it's convenient, it's pleasant, and it, it can serve so many different neighborhoods in the district. And it, it crosses over uh, state lines, too. I mean, you can hit National Harbor in Maryland, you can hit Alexandria in Virginia, you can go further down the Potomac River. So it's, it's sort of a regional solution. Yeah. Our location is right, it's right on the water, right in the middle of uh, the, the city, so it couldn't be better located. I, I see a lot of developers wrestling with how much parking to put in their project, whether it's an office or an apartment building. Am I wrong that you all have parking that could be converted to something else down the road, I think, is that right? Did you guys think about that? We, the, the first level of below grade parking is about 13 and a half, 14 feet tall. So uh -huh. you, you could actually put retail uses in there. We, right now we've, we've put a couple restaurants and uh, the, the kitchen for the Requin restaurant is actually below grade. And then also there's a, a music venue called Union Stage that's not yet open, but it's actually entirely below grade. So you access it off an alley and then go down, downstairs. And then in the second phase, we're looking at replicating that, p perhaps get a grocery store or a market that the, the largest part of the footprint is below, below grade, so it's more like an iceberg and it has an entrance on the, on the ground floor, but most of it is below grade. That's so interesting. What about you, uh, Brian? How, much is Metro, how critical is Metro to the work that you're doing? Um, I actually could not, uh, I could not overstate how important, um, and I, I, will, I will broaden that to public transportation, not just Metro, that public transportation is to the vitality, not just of Washington, D.C., but this entire region. Um, you know, I know that there's been a lot of talk, as there should, have, as there should be, around Metro, um, especially about the long-term viability of, of making sure the Metro is successful. You know, the, the truth of the matter is, is that our region has really just been funding um, one-year increments uh, to make sure that it, that it works. I know the district has been, uh, I think, pretty clear, and I know our council even voted recently that we're interested in, in providing a solution for the long-term funding for uh, Metro. We're hopeful that Maryland and Virginia also sort of see the light a little bit um, mm -hmm. and, and come on board. But I think uh, sometimes I, I have to remind myself and remind other people, we are not Houston. We are not Charlotte. We are not Nashville who are struggling with building out their public transportation network, who are trying to figure how can I spend billions of dollars to expand my fledgling system. We have a system. Mm -hmm. We just have to worry about how to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that from that perspective, we are much better than many other places are uh, in the United States. The other thing that I, I just want to say about transportation uh, is that Metro is a, is a large component of it. Bike uh, ability, uh, shared vehicles, uh, an increased boat access. Washington, D.C. is one of the rare places in the United States where you can get to your job through a lot of different methods, and we need to take advantage of that more. Um, if you look at our, there's a map we have in our office that looks at development in 2030, and if you look at where that development occurs in 2030, 75% of it is within a half mile of metro stops. Mm. And so, this uh, reliance on public transportation, whether that's metro or other places, is only going to increase uh, as we continue to grow out because public transportation is our future. Yeah. One, one thing, point on that is at the same time, obviously people are still getting to a lot of their work, uh, jobs, restaurants, et cetera, with cars. You recently decided to back a major investment in a parking garage at Union Market, if you've been to Union Market. Uh, Union Market has the developers that have this um, really aggressive plan for growth in future years, apartments, hotels, offices, more retail. Uh, why did this, why did the deputy mayor's, why did the mayor's office decide to back uh, an investment in paying for a parking garage in New yeah. York? And it, the good thing about this, it wasn't just the mayor's office, it was also the majority of the council who, who did this as well. The, the union market area, um, I think two things sort of differentiated a little bit more than some of the other projects. One is it's uh, it really is going to be much more retail focused than I think some of our other areas. I think that they get close to about a million square feet of retail when they finally build out, uh, which is fairly unusual in Washington, D.C. to have that kind of concentration. 
And when you have that much retail, we know that we want it to be, and it is designed to be, a regional destination, not just a destination that you can get to from the New York Avenue Metro, which, by the way, is how I'm going to get there yep. um, uh, increasingly. But other people from Reston, from Laurel, from Baltimore, from Boston are more likely going to take a car uh, to get there. And so we wanted to make sure that there was uh, some consideration for how regional draws and the ability for people to be able to access that. Right, we have a question from Facebook that I think is probably best for Brian. Um, this is uh, the question I asked, as DC tries to attract more people in tech and the startup community to Washington, what is the city doing uh, to, to, to sort of um, cooperate or use the talent that we have growing here? And people are coming out of school here or grew up here. Yeah, we, uh, we have a very strong pipeline from the existing universities that are producing awesome uh, producing awesome uh, graduates, and so we are continually uh, providing opportunities for those graduates to see the business opportunities, see the job openings that are happening. Something else that I also wanted to mention is that it, it doesn't just uh, stop at our at our universities. You know, we have hospitals, we have other companies that produce a tremendous amount of talent. Uh, I know that you've covered the Living Social mm -hmm. project in the past. And I think sort of the great storyline about Living Social, even though it no longer exists today, A, is that the city didn't put any money into it because we had a performance-based incentives. But more importantly, you've got great people uh, like the Framebridge founder who used to work at Living Social. So like, mm -hmm. even, if, uh, even if a company is not successful, we're finding that the talent that is uh, contained in that company stays in this region, which is what we need. Yep, absolutely. Um, I would love to take more questions. We're out of time. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate the conversation. It could have gone another hour easily for me, but and thank you all for coming. I appreciate that very much also.